so we are live now and good evening everyone i prutim das uh, founder of the calcutta compact is 1919 welcome you all to the 90th lecture of the lecture series on this platform uh, calcutta compact is 1919 is an independent forum for research scholars of humanities and social sciences it carries the legacy of the academic study of indian languages and literature envisioned by sir ashutosh mukherjee and introduced in 1919 at the university of calcutta later a separate department was published in 2005 under the leadership of professor dishnath rai and where the students from this department and took inspiration from this history of studying different uh, disciplines in one place and created this forum for sharing research interest and ideas among us and with the uh, scholars from different parts of world we are currently organizing online lectures in various interdisciplinary topics to be delivered by academician and distinguished research scholars of different fields and uh, i am very happy that today we have with us dr shadan jha from uh, uh, center for the social sciences surat and i would now uh, introduce a uh, Dr. Shadan Jha uh, for our participants. Dr. Shadan Jha is currently associate professor at the Center for the Social Studies, Shura. His research interest lies in the areas of visual culture, history, education, urban society, folk knowledge, partition violence, and literature. He is already widely published, and uh, I'd like to name a uh, few. Uh, among it is references, resistance, and the politics of. seeing the Na indian national flag which is published from Cam cambridge university press 2016 uh, another uh, book is uh, neighborhoods in urban india in between home and the city uh, edited along with devnath pathak and omyo kumar das published for, uh, i think uh, it's published in book from bloomsbury 2021 and another forthcoming uh, book uh, is already working for last, i think last two years was living and uh, living home belonging and memory in migration edited along with uh, pushpendra uh, professor pushpendra singh uh, and it will be uh, it will uh, come very soon from ratlet so uh, these are the things and apart from it uh, he also writes quite regularly for indian economic and social history review uh, history and sociology of south asia the sage indian express manushi the uh, conversation and huffington post etc so a uh, very uh, Welcome to Professor uh, Shadan Jha, and I am uh, really uh, grateful to uh, him uh, for giving us to and join us for this evening. And uh, Professor, you may uh, begin your lecture now, and uh, that's it. Uh, so, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Pratim. Thank you, Aritrika, uh, and uh, uh, let me uh, begin by. Uh, no uh, expressing my gratitude to you uh, as well as to uh, calcutta uh, comparatists in 1919 i did not know honestly about this collective until a few days back when we started conversing and uh, it's a you know uh, this is connected to the topic that i i chose to um, talk today because you know uh, we are fellow travelers me pratim uh, aratrika we are researchers so on the road of social science research we are fellow travelers and even when you know uh, when you are traveling even when you don't know people very intimately you enter into conversation and then these conversations Uh, take different shapes and this is today uh, what we are discussing is one form of conversation in that same sense so i chose to talk about uh, this conversations which happen on the road uh, and before uh, you know we start uh, the you know the subject uh, just as i mentioned one thing about you know conversation with uh, pratim and then this wonderful collective which has a very rich history and uh, uh, i was going through youtube uh, you know channel and found that many illustrious names earlier uh, given uh, delivered lectures so i feel truly honored to be here among uh, uh, you 
Now, the second thing is uh, about this uh, conversation that I'm conversation on the go is this. I started this also, you know, working on this topic uh, as me and uh, my uh, fellow uh, editor, my colleague Gauri Bharat, we started talking about the idea of uh, street life. Uh, she uh, teaches uh, architecture at SEPT University Ahmedabad, where I sometimes visit and deliver lectures. So between those, you know, studio recess, we started talking about uh, roads and uh, social aspects of roads. And we realized that in India, though we have a good amount of essays and uh, remunerations, uh, reflections on road, uh, on street life, but there is no, no full length book. There is no, not even one single edited uh, volume entirely de uh, dedicated, focused on the social dimensions of road in India. So this is where the journey began. And uh, many of the things that I'm going to talk here, uh, I have, I mean, we have submitted very recently, we have submitted the manuscript uh, and hopefully it will come uh, in, uh, you know, a few months time. Uh, perhaps in the first quarter of uh, 2022. So many of the things that I'm going to talk today are very raw in that sense. And uh, it certainly lacks certain finesse, certain, you know, the formal, you know, aspects of, uh, you know, with which we are normally associated with social science research. So it's that rawness I wanted to keep alive because it's in that rawness, in that texture, we enter into conversations whenever we are on the road. So that's that's the second point. The third thing is that, you know, uh, it's the larger question uh, that I am uh, actually pondering is how to talk about the, this space of a, a street and a street life. There are urbanists who have written on uh, streets. And uh, then uh, there are historians who have written on economic dimensions of a street, you know, trade routes, transportation, that kind of stuff. How to you know, move away from uh, those aspects or people have written about streets or roads as in terms of infrastructure, uh, in uh, you know, colonial period, we do have very good uh, scholarship. But I uh, was wondering how to talk about this street life, not merely as infrastructure, not merely as an economic you know, trade route or, you know, from the vantage point of uh, travel history, but as something which actually touches our lives. Whenever we go uh, to different, uh, to another city, or quite often we enter into conversation with uh, rickshaw driver, with taxi driver, very mundane kind of conversations. But many times these mundane conversations which happen on the road actually you know, remain quite you know, strong in our memory. How to talk about these conversations? And through these conversations, I argue that street and street life reveal its exteriority. People have talked about street life from the vantage point of public versus private. I don't want to enter into the, that domain either. So it's there is one thing I talked about. I just mentioned the, the issue of uh, 
this uh, rawness in the conversation. The second thing is this issue of fluidity, uh, this exteriority. So there are these conversations which cannot take place inside whom. Then what is this? What is the status of these conversations and how uh, we should engage with these uh, conversations? That's the larger anxiety I have. Uh, and this is where I uh, you know, would also think a lot, uh, you know, think loudly and think along the lines of provocations given by Deleuze and Guttari when they you know, uh, they go for nomadology. Now, in Deleuze and Guttari, nomadology is a kind of critique to uh, the philosophy of sciences. But they also say that it's, it's this, you know, the sedentariness, sedentary nature of philosophy, of history that they are critiquing. So, for example, whenever people write about a street, the epistemic frame remains driven by you know, the idea of home. So from home, that vantage point, people talk about a street, its exteriority, you know, street as third place. I actually want to question that. And in order to question that, I am thinking along the line of Deleuze and Guttari's provocation about nomadology. Just as they say that for them, nomadology is a critique where they say that they are leaving philosophy as philosophers. So, you know, taking a cue from them, I would say that though I am trained in the um, discipline of history, I want to abandon history as historian, as a historian. So this is a play with my disciplinary engagement with space. This is also a kind of play with the space called street. The third thing, and this play, I again uh, follow uh, Guttari and Deleuze, that this play, this play uh, opens up a kind of schizoid training lines of flight as a contrast to the sedentary power of science and history. So this is, this is one thing. The another, you know, uh, uh, you know, vantage point I would offer another provocation comes from a couplet of Kabir, the famous Julaha, uh, and I, I love this couplet. Uh, this couplet says that Kabira Khara Bajar me liye lukati hat jo ghar phuka apna chale hamare saath. So the moving away from the home, the sedentric nature that I was alluding uh, when I was referring to Deleuze, here that iconoclasm is very poignant in Kabir's. Uh, uh, this uh, couplet. If, I mean, it says that if I translate it, Kabir is standing in the market, in the bazaar, having a torch, fire torch in his hands, and one who has already tossed his house can come with him. So, you know, this again Bazaar, if you uh, know here, I would like to you know, uh, uh, bring in a famous historian, theoretician, uh, Professor Deepesh Chakravarti, who has argued that in South Asian context, if you are talking about street, it cannot be in isolation from bazaar or fairs. So 
there is a spatial complex within which we have to talk about these elements. His concern is primarily from the urban you know, uh, locations. So in South Asian context, there is no separation between bazaar and street. And in that, if you bring this with Kabira's you know, couplet, where Kabira is standing in the bazaar, actually it, it says that Kabira is standing on the road and then giving this call for iconoclasm, for burning of the houses. So, you know, bringing these impressions together, how can we talk about street life and conversations on this street? Now, this means that we have to leave the secure you know, home of history, its methodology, and then enter into conversations with strangers, strange methodologies perhaps, other disciplines. And this is something that I'm trying to do. So some of you may find this lecture a bit fragmentary and maybe meaningless, but I would welcome any kind of provocations, any kind of questions. And this is a modest attempt to engage with the idea of conversation itself on the road. So with this, you know, preface, let me read something and this is poems with six verses. This is from Therigatha. And I am reading the translated verse. It says, and I quote, I was wounded by grief for my son. Mind unhinged, mad, without clothes, hair unkempt. I walked from place to place. Resting on heaps of garbage in the streets, in cemeteries, on highways, I wandered for three years, always hungry and thirsty. This is by Vasethi from Poems with Six Verses, Therigatha, Poems of the First Buddhist Woman. The street is a refuse for destitute, grief-stricken, and homeless like Vasethi in these verses. These are utterances of theories, the senior ones, the enlightened Buddhist woman from the time of the Buddha himself. According to Buddhist traditions and from the end of the third century BC, according to historians. These are in all likelihood, the first narratives in the first person about street life in India. These are about looking at the street from the viewpoint of subalterns. A street is a surface. A street is a metaphor. As a surface, it is about distances and connections between locations. It is tangible, material, and an infrastructure. As a physical form, endowed with contours, it comes into existence by practice and history. It can be planned, designed, and built into being. In this zone of meaning making, the street is a precondition for economic life, for the circulation, and the transportation of commodities. On the other hand, as a metaphor, the street is an intangible linguistic trace, a cultural site, and an idea. 
both as a tangible physical space and as a metaphor, what is common and at the core is its exteriority. For those pavement dwellers who take refuge on the street, like Basethi, streets are part of the private property. Sorry. For those pavement dwellers who take refuge on the street, there may be ways of making the street as a private space. In large farms and mansions of the rich, street are, streets are part of the private property prohibiting trespassers. Yet away from the public-private binary, streets are fundamentally exterior spaces as there can be no insight to them. How does this exteriority acquire its articulation and get configured in society? What is so unique about a street which distinguishes it from other social spaces like, like that of a home or an office, a residence or a work site, a marketplace, a neighborhood, a park or a playground? This is certainly not to ignore or erase the overlapping features between streets and other spaces. The idea is also not to enter into some kind of comparative analytical frame, even when I am not sure if one can completely avoid thinking about other spaces while dealing with the street. In addition, the purpose of this lecture is not to conceptually define this distinction. Instead, I practice through figures and activities which give streets a distinctive flavor as a social space in the context of India. These figures and activities are fundamentally tied to streets in a manner that we cannot conceive them without the street. Their lives and streets are intertwined with one another. Streets sustain numerous activities and people who in turn get identified by these activities. Through these, I try to explore the linkages between a surface called the street and the society. Keeping alive a certain wanderlust as the spirit of the street, I try to write, to talk to you about the street like a journey in which a flanier or a bricolier picks up his material as he proceeds. So I, uh, it's a long um, piece and here what I thought is to talk about two stories in particular. Uh, and the first story is from you know, the time of the theories, uh, Basethi that we just you know, came across in the first you know, impression the verse that I, I uh, quoted. Uh, just to uh, you know, check, am I audible? Is it going all right? Uh, no, because online I can't. Yes, have... professor. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to get a kind of reassurance. Uh, Okay, so the first story that I want to talk about is about a charioteer and the young prince. It's about a prince named Siddharth Gautam who had an extremely protected and luxurious life. As a prince, this was obvious, but owing to a prophecy, his father, the Sakya king, was extra cautious. The prince was not exposed to life outside the palace. However, one day when he was 29 years old, he heard of the forests carpeted with tender grass, with their trees resounding with the coquillas adorned with lotus pounds. He expressed a desire to venture out of the confines of the palace walls arrangements were made 
ensuring to ward off any possible encounter of any afflicted common person in the high road. Then having removed out of the way with the greatest gentleness of all those who had mutilated limbs or mind senses, the disrupt and the sick and all squalid beggars, they made the highway assume its perfect beauty. On the highway, the prince saw an old man and asked about him from his charioteer named Channa. This was the first among the four sights when the prince witnessed an old woman, old man, a sick man, a dead body and a monk on the highway. For the prince, these were the first encounters with Duk, loosely translated as sufferings in English, eventually leading him to renunciation and his attainment of enlightenment as the Buddha. The highway was not merely a setting in these encounters, but also functioned as a site of conversation between the future Buddha and the charioteer Channa on the realities of life. These encounters are foundational to Buddhism. I would also like to argue that such encounters and conversations don't come from the history of Buddhism though. The Upanishadic and the later Vedic frames, which were, sorry, uh, let me um, read. I would also like to argue that such encounters and conversations don't come from the history of Brahmanism. The Upanishadic and the later Vedic frames, which were dominant and against which Buddhism, Jainism and other heterodox sects emerged in the 6th century BC had a long pastoral and an immediate agrarian lineages. Therefore, for Balmiki, the Sanskrit poet, the moment of experiencing the pain happened in the forest when he was a witness of the cry of a hurt and injured prone bird and the first verse of Sanskrit spontaneously came out of him. So there is something fundamentally non-Brahmanical in these conversation, in this conversation between young prince, future Buddha and charioteer Channa. This dialogue between Channa and the Prince Siddharth was unlike the often referred conversation that took place between the mythic charioteer Lord Krishna and the archer warrior Arjun in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, which come from Bhagavad Gita, an important philosophical treatise of Brahmanical Hinduism in later centuries. The conversation between the charioteer Channa and Prince Siddhartha is less audacious and it has a definite subaltern side to it. As Channa is an ordinary charioteer and not a king who temporarily chose to be char a charioteer in the case of Krishna Arjun conversation. Writing several centuries later, Aswaghos paints a vivid description of street scenes when the prince came out, making the above conversation possible. He also mentions the authority and the care shown by the King Suddhodana to protect his son, the Prince Siddharth, from such possible sightings on the street. Asughosa writes, he rebuffed him whose duty it was to see that the road was clear, suggesting some sort of royal authority and regulatory mechanism in place for the street. Although Asughose's description came from a much later period and we don't know enough about governance aspects of street from sources contemporary to Buddha, one can only speculate that the person who was the subject of King's ire would have been a predecessor of Nagaraka, 
at times also referred as Pramukhya from Kautilya's Arthasastra, who was responsible for the inspection of the conditions of the roads. Though in later centuries, the word Nagaraka came to acquire a generic property and meant city dwellers or someone having an urban sensibility and cultured mannerism. In Arthasastra, he was a subordinate to Samaharta and he, his duties included various day-to-day -day affairs of city administrator, administration, such as inspection of the sources of city's water supply, inspection of the condition of roads, of subterranean passages, of city's grounds and city's defenses. He was also responsible for things lost or for stray cattle in the city. For these tasks, he had two subordinate officers named Sthanika and Gopa. The governance of the road was quite elaborate in Arsast and we find that whoever threw dirt in the street were liable to be punished with a fine of one eighth of a panna, that one causing mire or water to collect in the street was to be fined one fourth of a panna, and for committing ever offenses on the Rajmarg, the punishment was the doubling of the ever fines. A great deal of road administration was related to policing of the road. Wayfarers going along a highway or by a footpath were supposed to catch hold of any person whom they find to be suffering from a wound or ulcer or possessed of destructive instruments or tired of carrying a heavy load or timidity avoiding the presence of others or indulging in too much sleep or fatigued from a long journey or who appears to be stranger to the place in localities such as inside or outside the capital, temples of gods, places of pilgrimage, or burial grounds. When, while we cannot be sure that such expectations from citizens were specific to monarchical aspirations getting reflected in Arthasastra, or whether these were in vogue even during the Republican period of Buddha. Yet, one may safely argue that the sight of a suffering human body on the high street, that became the starting point of the conversation between the prince and his charioteer in the earlier mentioned story was not an isolated episode. This was, at least in later centuries, a well-recognized governance issue in the policing of the street. In a later text, the fear of the stranger on the road comes quite palpable when Padma Prabha Gatka mentions on the royal road, the touch of strangers is easy to come by. The sight of the stranger and a suffering body on the street are crucial ingredients of the Buddha story. However, for me, the key is the conversation. The prince asks the question, prince asks questions and responses come from his charioteer. Normally in case of Buddha's other stories, this order of asking questions and receiving responses is reversed. Ubiquitous, ubiquitously, Buddha, the enlightened one, is not the seeker but a provider of the knowledge in those other stories. Here. In this story, a young prince is seeking knowledge of the everyday world and its sufferings from a charioteer. The street is the site making such a conversation possible. The street is the site making such a role, re role reversal happening. The street makes it possible for us to shift our attention from the young prince to the subaltern charioteer. The figure of the charioteer in such an altered perspective then demands a little more contextual detail. Now I, I go into uh, the detail about this figure of charioteer and I'm not going to uh, 
know, read this segment. But basically, what I do here is to make an argument that while in Vedic period, charioteer had an, a much better social status by the time of post Vedic phase, by the time of Buddhas, the social status of charioteer declined considerably. And, you know, uh, thinking from that perspective, it is this conversation, this between a subaltern and the young prince, that is quite crucial for me. So the street is a kind of leveler where a subaltern is giving gyan to the prince. And prince is seeking that uh, actively from him, from his charity. And the, another point I am making uh, in, in subsequent passages of my essay is about the urban context in which this uh, conversation is taking place. Now I'm skipping this uh, to mention very briefly about another story, set of stories where a street becomes a contested site even in 6th century BCE where Jainism and Buddhism are making claims. For example, we have conversations between Mahabir Jain and Makhaliput Gosal, in which we find that ultimately narrative resolves into the superiority, establishing superiority of Mahabir Jain over Gosal. Obviously, these stories that I'm just mentioning come from Jain sources and there is a kind of legitimizing, uh, legitimization happening about Mahabir Jain's authority over other you know, uh, sects, his contemporaries like Makaliput Gosal. Now, I, I have to cover a wide uh, canvas, as I said that uh, I, I want to I wanted to flow. Uh, so I don't want to remain confined to these two stories here. And instead, now I take a jump you know, from the charioteer and young prince. I come to the colonial period or you know, the post-colonial to be more specific and to talk about two specific figures. So after charioteer, the second figure that I want to talk about is, about, is bullock cart driver. And this is uh, the brief you know, story I want to tell is from the film Tisri Kasam, where another kind of conversation takes place on the road between bullock cart driver Hiraman and Hirabai. And before we enter into, uh, before I would uh, no, explain. Uh, can we uh, show a brief clip, uh, Pratim, if that's possible, uh, from Tisri Kasam? Uh, yes. This is a sequence uh, which precedes the song Dunya Banane Wale Kya Tere Man Me Samai. Tisri Kasam is from 1966, written by. Paniswar uh, Nath Renu, his story is called Tisri Kasan Urf Mare Gai Gulfam and film 
is directed by Basu Bhattacharya. Salen was quite instrumental. Raj Kapoor and Vaidya Raman were in the key roles, lead roles. And this is an iconic song. Dunya banane wale kya tere man me samai kahe ko dunya banai. But before that, a conversation took, takes place, and I want to show you that clip of this conversation uh, between Hiraman and Hirabai. Uh, Shuman, uh, please uh, uh, play the clip. Uh, the uh, uh, volume is a bit low here. Can you increase it? Shuman, uh, please raise the volume and start it from the beginning. No, no, can we start from the beginning? Uh... Uh, uh, Professor, I think. Uh, okay. Sort of... Anyway, uh, yeah. You know, the. Okay, we can. Yes, um, we are trying. We are trying it again. And uh, okay. Different. Yeah, the the point I I am trying to make is where the bullock cart diverts from the main road. Uh, in the very beginning. So you know, if possible, otherwise we can talk. Yes, uh, Shuman is trying it once. Uh, otherwise. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just yeah. wait one second. Uh, I think uh, if not, or if the sound is not coming. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, it's fine. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, those interested, uh, you can watch this sequence on YouTube. And this is where it's about leaving the road, abandoning the road. Huh. This. Yeah, it's.
Okay, uh, let me uh, now talk about it. Um, you know, what happens is that the Hirabai, who is a traveling company, Nauchkan, she uh, hears Hiraman, the bullock cart driver, humming, and then she requests him to uh, sing the song, full song. Now, uh, following this request, Hiraman says that if you want to hear this song, which you are quite keen to hear, then I have to leave the main road. Main road, the Chalu Rasta, par koi geet kaise ga sakta hai. He is he, very feeling very sigh. And this is where he leaves the, the main road, takes a detour, and the, then he narrates the song. And in that song, a story, a folk story of a, a suffering girl, Mahua Ghatbaran, comes into play. Now, I am not going to uh, enter into those aspects. But this leaving the trap, leaving the, the main road is, uh, is crucial to my scheme of things. Leaving the track, you know, is, is like leaving the pakki road and it has its own dangers. Uh, very recently when uh, this uh, conversation poster came out, a very good, very uh, close friend of mine, he sent me a beautiful uh, you know, excerpt from a memoir by uh, Rahul Sankrityan, uh, Prabhat, uh, who is uh, in uh, CSDS Delhi. He sent me this memoir in which uh, we come across a story where you know, in the evening, uh, person is walking on the main road and he realizes that somebody is else is also walking along with him not on the main road but lower uh, down the road on the kachi i don't know uh, what do you call kachi in 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 uh, bengali a kachi is unpaved way uh, uh, unpaved path you can say or the, the mud track along the main road. And that person who was walking along this, this guy, he was constantly calling him and asking him to join him, leave the pakki. The, the fellow who was walking on the pakki, the main road, felt something amiss, something not proper, and he ignored the call. After some time, after some persuasion, the person who was walking on the kachi, on the, on the mud road, he said that, Jao aaj tum bach gaye. You go today, uh, no, you are saved. And he said that it's because of the pakki sarak of Sarkar Bahadur. No. The main road constructed by the colonial king, he was saved. Had there been main road in his village too, then he would not have paid much heed to the people Baba. Now, so now cutting the story short, people Baba is, you know, many of us might have come across these kind of trees which are considered as abode of ghosts and spirits. So in this memoir of Rahul Sankritan, the person who was walking on the Kachi, who was afraid of entering on the Pakki Sarak, was actually a ghost and he was luring the traveler to come down to, to abandon the Pakki, leave the Pakki and come to the Kachi. So, you know, there, there is a whole cultural logic, uh, experiential logic, belief pattern about 
leaving the main road and entering into detour the the song sequence uh, that i was referring to tisri kasam actually you no know, points towards those kind of rich cultural narratives about abandoning the track abandoning the leak at times abandoning the highway or the road and opting for a shortcut an untrodden path is not forbidden though it may entail dangers in most of the cases recorded by sleeman for example the thugs convince travelers to abandon the highway and opt for a way passing through thick jungle or uninhabited territories in colloquial terminology particularly in north india such a move is referred to as leak chhodna leak chhodna padega it is even considered civilness a folk saying declares leak leak gaadi chale लीके चले कपूत तीन लीक पर ना चले सुरमा सती सपूत द अन एंटरप्राइजिंग बैड सन ट्रेवल्स ऑन द बीट एन रोड जस्ट एज द एकार्ट मूव ऑन द व्हील ट्रैक बट थ्री डू नॉट मूव ऑन द वॉन्टेड लाइन्स द बोल्ड द सती एंड द एंटरप्राइजिंग सन गुड सन the move is also known as opting for a kachi by quitting a pakki and this is what i was referring when uh, i was mentioning about tisri kasam's the song sequence tisri kasam is essentially about the friendship materialized on the road between a bullock cart driver and his passenger in the course of their journey from railway station to a local fair both enter into a relation of complicated affection faith and evolved curiosity the innocence of the bullock cart driver is quite prominently juxtaposed with the sensuous performer hira bhai she bids farewell to hira man at the railway station in the last you no know, climax sequence of tisri kasam she bids farewell to hiraman at the railway station and invites him to come and see her in a different show the film ends with hiraman taking his third bow telling his bullocks that he will never carry a notanki dancer again in the initial phase of this bullock cart journey we come across the driver oh we we just talked about this so if the discourse on the street is about freezing the scholarship into urban milieu the bullock cart is perhaps one of the most disorienting objects to pay attention to over the course of last couple of centuries it has acquired a status of representing the rural the retrogressive circulating in the metaphor of bullock cart economy which tagore once used while condemning mahatma gandhi's spinning car spinning wheel it is also a kind of slowness that is quite dissimilar to the new found love for bicycles among health conscious and environment warrior metropolitan middle class there is a particular peculiar visual investment that one can easily notice in the depiction of bullock cart in tisri kasam and you know subsequent publicity materials that came with the sikasam film this can be read as central to the portrayal of this locality as rural and as backward bullock cart a mode of transportation in rural areas ferrying people and goods from one place to another however outside rural settings the same cart acquires a different status the cart no longer remains a mere vehicle of transport but becomes a signifier signifying all that stands for the rural
we have a number of imageries where the mere presence of the bullock cart translocates our gaze in some rural settings. At times, only the cart is sufficient. Grierson in his peasant, Bihar peasant life has paid considerable attention to these carts. In the 1961 census handbook for Purnia district, it is called Sampanis. The census handbook for Purnia district notes with recent development schemes, the importance of the bullock cart, which was a universal conveyance in the village has gone down. In spite of it, it will remain for a long time the conveyance through which the requirements of the villagers could be met easily and at a cheaper rate. No improvement in the mechanism has taken place. It is used both for carrying goods and passengers. Tapparwala bullock carts, which have covers are still popular, but their num number has decreased. Companies are commonly used for the transport of passengers. Bullock cart, I shall argue, functions as the punctum of roller bars, capturing our attention in this frame, capturing and arresting the gaze to refashion it in a particular direction. In this way, it is influential in shaping the meanings that we derive from this frame. However, on a second thought, however, on a second thought, and after placing this cart, is the host of rural imageries. We find the cart more as a field of cultural interest, the stadium rather than the punctum that takes us beyond the image to launch a desire beyond what this picture permits us to see. In other words, the cart appears as a visual metaphor. Although we don't have comparative data, in all probability, with the arrival of mechanized mode of transportation, the bullock cart status in the transport sector declined considerably. Now here I, I go into the medieval period and uh, we don't have much time, uh, so I skip that. And uh, how much time uh, do we have, uh, Pratim? Uh, pro professor, uh, you can take I mean, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. OK, want. OK. Um, so here, I, I, I would bring just mention, you know, um, another uh, storyline from another film, Naya Dor. 1957, directed and produced by B.R. Chopra and ha having Dilip Kumar and Vajayanti Mala in lead roles. Set in a village, it is about a fight for the survival of Tongas against the bus. At another level, what is offered as bounty is both the beloved and the road. You know, so there is a fight and whoever wins the fight will control the road and will marry the beloved, played by Bajanti Mala. As the film progresses and the fight is offered to resolve the narrative tension, the protagonist Sankar undertakes a Herculean task of building a parallel, shorter road itself for his Tonga. Ultimately, the Tonga wins the race over the bus and the road, beloved, remains with the former, with the hero. So both Tisri Kasam and Nayador romance with the slowness and can be seen as a resistance to the inevitable, the rule of the mechanized speed. While the screen narratives romantically immerse in slowness, the post-independence historical context abundant abundantly signals in the other direction. Apart from losing on the spree, speed, the bullock cart's demise has to be analyzed at least on two counts. First, 
the railways were conceived as serving the empire far more effectively than the road transport secondly the animals on the road oxen in the case of bullock cart and horse or camels etc in the case of tonga buggies carts etc the animals on the road were ixum for engineers and administrators of the empire animals were key in the debate on the metal or unmetal road since at least the middle of the 19th century itself in 1853 john william key wrote that the people in india complain that the metal roads wear out the hoofs of their beasts they are often to be seen traveling by the sides of the trunk roads anywhere rather than on the road nehalal a historian writes that metal roads were suited to horses and carriages drawn by horses as these animals were perforce sought which enabled them to travel on the hard metal roads with ease whereas in india the draught animals were never sought and therefore metal roads were not the best surface for these animals to trot on which resulted in natives seeking routes that were easy on the hooves of their animals the situation for cattle that drew carts was not no different except that the wheels of the cart moved better on metal roads however these narrow steel wheels damaged the me mechanized surface sorry damaged the macadamized surface as they would cut through causing deep grooves so using such a logic the british government leaving most roads unmetalled is interesting and convenient when seen in relation to policy privileges accrued to the railways now i also skip here because uh, my as i made in the very beginning my interest is not in the history of transport so i must return back to our stories of conversations on the road there is an another distant parallel and this is the last story that i want to narrate and there is an another distant parallel in our discussion on tisri kasam will be the film highway a 2014 film directed by imtiaz ali and produ produced by najid nadia wala the road scapes and the technology have changed even when there are so many dissimilarities the reason for referring to highway is the conversation and the bonding between the driver and the passenger here the driver is a rural subaltern yet masculine kidnapper and the passenger is elite urbane and feminine they move from one place to another in a truck the roads traverse a landscape which forcefully convey cartographic limits of state authority it is the gujar landscape spread from salt fields of gujarat to himachal pointing to spatial connotations of what a friend of mine garima dhabai who teaches in presidency calls the cartography of sovereignty in her study on royal processions walking through the streets of jaipur in highway the road and its externalities transform the kidnapped girl in her own imagination she is now portrayed no longer as a victim figure the narrative converts her into a jugni an untamed feminine spirit one that belongs to the road and here i would like the second clip uh, if uh, we can play that this is a jugni song from film highway pataka gudile namely this description is supposed to be what the jugni sees and observes herself as part of a journey first hand 
This makes the Jubni herself as the primary gauge of the witness as a commentator. And thirdly, there is the reporting authorial voice of the poet singer, who at best seems to function as only a secondary gauge. Thus, we have the scene, the primary observant gaze of Jugni and the secondary gaze of the poet singer who observes Jugni observing the scene and commenting. All this, of course, has changed in recent times. The popular film song has completely dislodged Jugni from her inevitable position as the primary gauge. Instead, she has now been reduced to a mere spectacle embodying feminine sexuality under a leering, jeering male gaze that might now and then lapse into mock admiration of a fierce, fiercely combative Jugni. Jugni no longer travels willfully and without a clearly identifiable cause. She has lost her ability to comment. And in many ways, this film Highway actually offers few counterpoints while I agree completely with Madan Gopal Singh's observations. In the film Highway, see, the one who has become Jugni fell in love with her male kidnapper. However, in a nationwide hunt, police tracks them down and kill the kidnapper lover, kidnapper male lover. She is brought back to home, but the road has already transformed her, empowers her, and she confronts the violence inside the home. The sexual abuse she was subjected to at the hand, hand of her own uncle. The exposure on the road makes it impossible for the home and the family system to contain her. She is transformed into a social worker who starts living at the edge of the society. It is ironic that on the screen, the first person voice of Jugni gets muted as Singh argues. When impressionistically off screen, we find women's presence increase on the road. The codes of gendered streets acquire another layer of complexity. Masculine road, however, continues. I end here and uh, hope it was making some sense. Uh, I would love to engage with questions, respond, try my level best to do that. Uh, uh, first of all, apology uh, to the participant and to the professor. I think there's some mild problem with the audio switch. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I think uh, they get the visuals from the second clip. And uh, before, uh, I think uh, the, uh, this floor, floor is open for the questions and comments. Uh, before that, uh, actually, I have uh, two or three things to like mention. This is entirely a uh, new area actually for me and like quite uh, fascinating uh, to hear from you, Professor. And uh, uh, I mean, I have the two or three things which is like uh, not entirely related to, to your talk. And while listening to you, I was uh, uh, thinking about the streets and the, like the uh, our day to day conversation and chats and addas and everything. And uh, uh, the thing actually is like uh, came to my mind is that uh, there's like a lot of evidence. I mean, both from like anecdotal evidence and like the large corpus of literature is available, which shows that uh, apart from the like the uh, activities of the transport purpose or some, uh, I mean, the transport and the motor vehicle, whatever is the movement is there. Apart from it, like we'll get to see that there is uh, various kind of activities uh, is happening. I mean, happened in the streets, uh, like uh, the, the street. Uh, we were, and I mean, I can remember in my childhood days, I used to play cricket on the streets of like the cities. Also, like uh, sometimes uh, you will say that uh, some sort of performance is happening in the street. Uh, I mean, in the middle of the streets and the, in the stage. So. Uh, uh, these are these sorts of like the uh, things which uh, used to like also uh, happened uh, in the in the in street space also. So I was uh, uh, also uh, another thing is like uh, the protest or the rallies, which is also like uh, 
the like, I mean heat sinks streets. And uh, I was wondering actually that uh, how uh, I mean uh, I mean together uh, consulting all these activities, how can like uh, we relate uh, or like uh, sort of conceptualize these activities uh, of in the streets, uh, which is like happening and. how it is like a you know, sort of engaging us to the different sort of roles uh, i mean different uh, nature of the public sphere in indian scenario so uh, that is like a one of uh, a small observation or like query for me and also like uh, these uh, uh, relations uh, uh, as you have been mentioning about the subaltern and everything i mean this relation of subalterns with the spatial uh, 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 space and how i mean how to, uh, you are thinking about to formulate it in a like a large arena and another small thing uh, which is like also uh, occurred to me here that uh, i was you uh, know imagining up the other streets while listening to you and especially that the uh, i mean the highway highway scenes and also that, that came to me suddenly that uh, in like like the partition stories and everything and the street is also like a recurrent motif i mean if you like uh, visit most of the check most of the pictures you will uh, i mean out of uh, 10 you will get to see the three or four pictures which is about the people walking on the streets or uh, and it can be some urban space or like some uh, rural space streets but it is like this uh, it's about the streets so i mean these diverse things and this whole yes. like the uh, i mean the sides of the streets Uh, how are like you are since i yes. you are mentioning that it's like very ra- um, i mean rough and raw for you to this like uh, lecture so how like you are going to negotiate in your projects or something so this is like my uh, question for you so you know uh, i mean this is the this is the challenge that street offers to you it takes you into different directions and uh you very rightly pointed out uh, that uh, the for example the relation between subaltern and the space uh, unfortunately the early uh, subaltern uh, studies ignored this spatial dimensions only you know recently uh, david arnold has uh, talked about street in in context of colonial madras and uh, you no know, so the spatial aspects is now you no know, uh, scholars are paying attention to but uh, this is fascinating uh, then uh, this whole thing about resistance which takes place on the street the 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 politics of the street uh, the demonstrations uh, so there are there are different aspects uh, of street life and we come across very you very rightly suggested that many anecdotes many references uh, where we come across very vibrant very vivid street life yet scholars have not paid enough attention between this uh, social dimensions and the uh, street life so streets you know remain the discourse remain caught up in what i mentioned in the beginning uh, as part of economics where it, uh, we have the uh, story of trade routes history of trade routes silk routes uh, is one uh, which has recently caught you know attention of scholars for you know global diplomatic purposes uh we have very good anthropological accounts on uh, street uh, on silk route uh archaeological accounts uh, also very creative way of writing uh, about life on the silk route uh and then we have discourses on street life coming from urban locations primarily from planning and uh, architecture perspectives so you know social historians or uh, uh other you know anthropologists they have in indian context i'm saying they have not paid enough attention to um, roads and streets uh, that's that's one thing and this is where uh, you know i think a lot of scope is there uh, 
uh, I have obviously you know, uh, kept my focus uh, only on uh, this conversations which take place on the street because these conversations, uh, this kind of bonding, you know, uh, is not possible at any other space. This is why, I mean, it's the, it's, it's the street which, uh, you know, defines, which gives these conversations its true meanings, true, true color. So I, 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 you know, kept my focus only on these conversations. And through these conversations, I have tried to point out uh, figures, social, uh, you know, uh, uh, segments who, whose livelihoods depend on streets. Today, I, I talked merely two, you know, I, I mentioned merely two such figures. One is the figure of charioteer uh, from ancient Indian uh, period, and another uh, called, you know, another is the bullock cart drivers. But there is a whole range of, you know, uh, uh, people. Uh, uh, I have I've talked about, uh, for example, in my essay, I, I talk about uh, palanquin bearers uh, known as kahars. And uh, there are kahar songs. Uh, uh, so, uh, and I, I, I talk about uh, thugs, you know, uh, uh, from colonial period and also from uh, medieval periods. These thugs, uh, you know, these were, they were marauders um, and they uh, used to have different tricks. Uh, they used to be friends with the travelers and then they used to convince them to leave the, the main route and opt for the shortcuts and detours so that they can kill them in mass. Uh, uh, in uh, the uninhabited or thick forest tracks. So, but we then also have a very fascinating, you know, um, uh, account, uh, first travelogue in Hindi uh, 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 written by Banarsi Lal Das. And he says that once he lost the track and the robber king actually you know, uh, gave him shelter and also showed him the path. He obviously disguised himself as Brahman and they, uh, you know, uh, thinking that he is the Brahman, he, they did not uh, do any harm to him. So there, there, there are a lot of stories, a lot of narratives. The issue is how you weave uh, these stories and what is your focus? Obviously, I enter it uh, through a kind of problematizing the social life, uh, social history. So that's my focus. And this is where, again, I chose to uh, harp on the conversation itself, conversations that take place on the road. Yes, absolutely, Professor. I mean, the, one of the most old, I think, old English evidence Joseph's Canterbury Tales is also about the streets. I mean, mm. he was like, uh, uh, they were like traveling to Canterbury and, and was like uh, taking a rest in Tavardin and then the whole conversation built up and from there like 24 stories came up. So yes, and also like, uh, since you are like mentioning travel writings and also, I have reminded my project actually, I, uh, I'm i doing for my PhD and like, uh, uh, there's a, um, a lot of mention of the like streets and the uh, mostly the uh, I mean the taverns and while uh, I mean where the travelers are taking rest for the days and like they are uh, engaging with others they are uh, sharing their nights and you know, like uh, I mean sort of like the reincarnation which it can found in the modern day dormitory hostels where like the bikers and everyone like passing by was like used to stay and like share their journey, share their experience and what. So it was like a really interesting yes. I mean, a new area for me. And also like the another thing is like while talking about the street journeys and everything, there's another aspect I, I, I mean, I like to mention here is that the street foods and everything. And in yes. the, I mean, talking about Indian street is like more about the street and the uh, street foods and the experience of gastronomy, yes. well, like mostly, yes. which is like uh, uh, 
uh, which, uh, often like see in various like platforms and the chai things and the uh, snacks and everything so yes i mean uh, this is all new area for me and i don't have much thing to comment but yes i would like to definitely venture and yeah. so i will uh, now pass on the mic to arthika if uh, she has anything to ask thank you prathin and thank you professor for this amazing lecture it's definitely a new area and you just gave us lot to think about also like uh, while you are talking about uh, we are talking about the streets and the uh, travelers passing uh, the space i mean um, if you contextualize it the uh, mm -hmm. travelers who are like uh, everyday common travelers and the nomads there is also a difference between that yes. i mean if you are talking about the silk road and even now there are many nomadic tribes and their yes. experience and ours will not be similar yes so how, how do we contextualize that i mean no definitely and uh, you know i uh, in the beginning when i was uh, mentioning referring uh, delius and gotari and their nomadology yeah, yeah, yeah. i was not referring to uh, nomads uh, as a social category but it was more a kind of epistemic you no know, kind of spin that uh, i was referring uh, no i fully agree and this is where you know uh, the nomads or the pastoralists uh, history somewhere has not done justice to them we look at uh, the you know them uh, this social group always from the point of view of society which is you no know, um, Uh, agrarian which is stable which is so it's the sedentric you no know, perspective through that we look at nomads you know uh, as i said i mean it's it's a it's a open area and uh, the way they are, they connect with the street the road is very different from the way uh, travelers coming from the settled society agrarian society connect with the the street unfortunately we don't have a uh, good accounts at least i am not aware of any good account from indian um, you know uh, uh, context so uh, as i i i take your point both you and pratim have you know pointed out that and i believe that uh, you know this is there are many things that um, our volume does uh, and one of the things that we argue in our editorial uh, introduction uh, where i and uh, my co-editor uh, gauri we argue that uh, there is a lot of scope of dialogue between social history and travel studies in indian context uh, Pratim, you mentioned, and you have been working on partition. I worked on partition for uh, for quite some time, and unfortunately, partition discourse, where journey is so crucial, scholars have not paid attention to journey itself. So, you know, similarly in migration studies, we don't have account of the journey that migrants undertake. Uh, i mean this does not say that we don't have material to invest into um, our focus into these aspects but unfortunately scholars have not paid attention to these aspects so while we have uh, you know very rich travelogues for example the one i mentioned in passing by uh, rahul sankrityan's uh, you know uh, voluminous account meri jeevan yatra so A social historian can make use of these travelogues to reflect on the street experience journey experience so you no know, in in that direction so while you know even the scholars who look at travel studies or historians they somehow don't pay attention to the activities happening on the street so for example from colonial accounts when historians reconstruct uh, you know uh, history they talk about what colonial you know that travel writer or the administrator uh, describes about villages so you have 
you know these writers reflecting from the street while on the go but not reflecting on the street so they are you know documenting things happening in villages not on the street itself so similarly you have in migration discourses you have the uh, rich analytical focus either on the point of origin or point of destination you don't have you know a good analytical description of the journey this trend however is not true you know people who have talked about or historians who look at the migration to caribbeans and you know overseas migration uh, from india the kuli migration uh, they you know very beautifully and very you know insightfully they tell us and they takes us to the journey the ship so ship becomes a site analytical site and there are very fine historians who who talk about ship life on the ship about about the ship but similarly the same thing is not true when migrant scholar scholars uh, of migration studies or historians talk about the overland migration so there we have the point of origin and the the destination what happens on the street is missing yes sir uh, actually i'm also working on for my phd on kuli migration okay. and my dissertation focuses mainly on inland migration the tea coolies and coal coolies and like as you said like uh, the dr ashutosh kumar is there and many other yes. such uh, the students are there they are focused so beautifully on the journey on the ship that yes. crossing the kalapani and everything but yes. uh, for the inland migration we don't have much books uh, or much text uh, apart from few uh, historians that or uh, about the journey the coolies mm-hmm. undertook from the chotna group latus to the ashram tea gardens yes. or the coal mines yes. it's true we don't have much of for the land migration have. yes so you know a lot of challenges uh, but i i i hope that streets offer lot of you know awards yes. to you know at the end uh, pratim can we take two more question uh, students uh, send it to me she was unable to write yes, on the yes. chat box okay okay, okay sure, so sure. Okay, okay. So I'm reading it out. Uh, Tulika, she is a student, uh, she's a master student in our department. Uh, she is asking that in present time we can see that in so many rural areas there is no use of the bullock cart, but in movies uh, based on rural I- India, they still use bullock cart to portray rurality. H- how is it convenient? Yeah, this is what I. Uh... you know mentioned that bullock cart has become a metaphor you know so but this was not the case in 1966 when the you know tisri kasam was uh, coming up and i in my essay i have given statistics of you know uh, bullock cart was still at that point of time the main you know uh, transportation uh, uh, transport main you know uh, Uh, carriage uh, for goods as well as for passengers uh, now obviously it has become a metaphor uh, uh, to uh, no uh, which signifies the rural sometimes it signifies the the backwardness the slowness all the it, so it has turned into a a, a kind of you know a signifier so it's not about you know uh, convenience or not i mean as a social scientist uh, as a researcher you don't you know give judgment whether it is convenient or not but uh, you analyze things uh, so uh, this is one way uh, when you know you have to depict the landscape which is rural you put a bullock cart a hut you know that kind of metaphors so these these have acquired a uh, the status of a visual metaphor which are to a large extent removed from the social life uh, in 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 actual 
you know, uh, scenario. This does not mean that there, there, there are no bullock cards. Um, still, you know, we have bullock cards, but obviously its status has constant, consistently and considerably declined. Thank you, sir. And uh, I have one last question. We'll give a pratin text over the mic. That like uh, in this pandemic uh, period, uh, like how the streets become an arena of the performance of state power. I mean, how the state is imposing control on the uh, streets during this pandemic, like the lockdown and everything. So the we are not able to, like people are not able to meet each other or many few yes. people are passing and we are all Whoever is passing or wearing a mask or in fear with the other people. So the whole arena of the street conversations and dialogues are changing. Yes, definitely. And this is where, you know, uh, I'm glad that you asked this question because uh, yeah, our project, uh, you know, uh, Corona started in the backdrop of Corona when we realized the empty streets. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we also realized that the suddenly, you know, uh, migrants started moving back and uh, they started taking, you know, the very long journey, very arduous journey. And uh, there is one particular incident which actually shook me a lot, uh, which was when near Aurangabad, 16 migrant workers who were walking from, uh, you know, uh, Mumbai perhaps to their hometown, they were crushed uh, on by the goods by a goods train while they were sleeping, you know, on the railway track. Yeah, Perhaps you know, so uh, yeah. It, this was horrible incident, and uh, you know, they must have been very tired, uh, or they might have fell on sleep uh, on the railway track. But you know, there is also another you know, uh, direction which this incident tells us, which is that in Indian context, uh, meaning of road is not singular. So uh, for many of these uh, workers, railway track was the only choice left for them. And they considered the railway track as road. Uh, uh, so it's the, uh, the track was functioning uh, both as railway track, but also as a road for these migrant workers. And this is not an isolated you know, event. We have many such reports where uh, workers you know, walking on the track got killed so many times. For example, those uh, some of you might have you know uh, come across or seen this film. There is a film called Mountain Man. Dasra, this is on Dasrat Maji. Nawajuddin Siddiqui uh, played the re lead role, and this is where Dasrat Maji, a uh, real life character uh, from Central Bihar, he goes from Bihar to Delhi, following the railway track. So the the psycho, you know, spatial authority of railway track on the mind of, uh, you know, subalterns cannot be denied. And they, you know, convert the railway track as a walking track. And in that, their imagination, the distinction between railway track and the road vanishes. So if road is not just about a particular built environment. If road is something which come to come to us by way of practices of you know social practices, then you know there is a doubling of this you know railway track and uh, the road in the in the practices of these subaltern workers, migrant workers. So there are there are again many challenges. There are again many analytical purchases uh, which take us to specificities of you know, street life in Indian context. Thank you, Professor. Pratim, if you. 
i hope i was not you know uh, racing uh, and i was audible and uh, because yes, i am yes, not sir, very sir, comfortable with okay yes sir, you are uh, you are perfectly audible and i mean we uh, very much get the idea about the whole thing less i mean it's a lack of uh, expertise that we uh, cannot comment much but yes i mean we can get the whole idea and how i mean the, some of the things are like very fascinating to me also like how you are like the gendering the roads and like the name like, also like in your previous volume i have read that you have also like uh, to- talked about the gendering about the neighborhoods paros and paros mm-hmm. and that that you are also like doing here also in the streets of india i mean uh, it's a like bit uh, fascinating and i would like to i mean accomplish both of you i mean you and professor gauri for, for your forthcoming volume i mean we're really oh, looking forward to it yes yes well definitely read it and uh, i think i wouldn't have much uh, more to add here uh, uh, arthita if you uh, can now uh, formally deliver the vote of thanks and good. yes thank you pratin and thank you dr sadhan ja for joining us today On the behalf of Calcutta Comparatives 1919 and its members, I would like to convey our heartiest thanks to Dr. Sadhan Ja for his excellent lecture. A big thank you to Sir for delivering your lecture and sharing your ideas with us. I'd like to express our gratitude to you, Sir for responding to us and coming to our forum. We are really inspired by your lecture, and it has uh, really in- opened up new areas which we look forward to. and thanks to all our audience on youtube for being with us today here you officially conclude this session now a very good night to all of you and thank you once again professor for joining us today thank you i i must thank you both of you and uh, the collective calcutta comparatists 1919 it's been honor to be here thank you it is our honor so thank you so much thank you